Our next speaker, Michael Savant. Been an, Michael's been an entrepreneur uh, in the Silicon Valley. There was for over 30 years. Um, he very early got into the sustainable movement in the early 90s. And um, recently, in the last few years, um, began to study public banking and as a means of uh, helping folks uh, with economic development. And uh, he is on our advisory board. And I'd like to you to welcome Michael Savon. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Is my microphone on? Is it come on? Okay. Um, first, I'd like to thank the wonderful folks at PBI, Ellen, Mark, Mike, um, Bob, and Ann, uh, and forgive me if I've forgotten anybody else uh, that have done such a fabulous job putting this together. It's an honor to be here, and thank you very much. Um, I've got multiple complex concepts that I'm going to be trying to present today, and um, that instead of trying to drill deep into them, as I go through the presentation, you're going to see a couple of points where I make reference to places on my website that you can go and read much more detailed information on uh, several of these topics. So instead of trying to drill into them, I, I'll you know, keep it at a, at a higher level. I'm also going to try and go through it quickly in order to leave time for uh, as much possible to, in the way of Q&A, because I've had a lot of people asking me questions, and I figure there's probably going to be a lot of questions. So if I go through it quickly, please bear with me that, uh, you know, that we've got, again, a lot to, to try and cover. What I'm going to be dealing with is the uh, three interrelated concepts here. Uh, each stands alone, and yet there is the intersection points dealing with the concepts of foreclosure, eminent domain, and public banking. Um, I will first be talking about uh, eminent domain and why it's relevant to all of us in the public banking space. Um, and I will later show the intersection between uh, that and public banking, essentially the concept of foreclosures yeah. is in their intersection space. And um, I think we all know very well that foreclosures probably almost more than anything else, you know, the whole housing environment stands at the center of the, the economic collapse that we've experienced in this country. And um, there's a lot of people who estimate that we're not even, or maybe just about halfway through the number of potential foreclosures that could occur. And we are already devastated. The country cannot tolerate that additional 50% of foreclosures you know, coming about. So we've been working on ways to try and actually bring a halt to foreclosures. And that's what led me into the, um, the analysis and discovery of the use of eminent domain as a tool for being able to do that, where even the smallest governmental entity has more legal power than the biggest bank on Wall Street. So let me go ahead and start to drill into that concept. First of all, very quickly, the concept of eminent domain, everybody's probably heard about it, have certain pictures or images of what it is, but in essence, it's the right of the state to be able to seize personal property if it's deemed to be in the benefit of the state and they're allowed to do so even without the owner's consent. It's almost impossible to legally stop a foreclosure proceedings um, by fighting it in court about the only thing a property owner can successfully do is contest the price that they're being paid for the property, not that it's being taken from them. So, I mean, this power of eminent domain is, is really enormous. Um, it actually goes all the way back to the Magna Carta and King John, the concept of the right of the state to be able to supersede the right of the individual. And uh, the term eminent domain came about uh, from this particular legal treatise in 1625. But um, for us here in the United States, the real origins of eminent domain go back to the fact that during the Revolutionary War, um, the colonists were often quite abused by primarily the British, but in some cases even our own you know, uh, armies, would confiscate food 
uh, metal for bullets, you know, and uh, as well as livestock and various other things, and not compensate the property owner for that. Uh, that just, as you can imagine, by the end of the, the war, that was an extreme sore spot. And so, um, you know, by the time we then developed our constitution, that the citizens demanded that, hey, if we're going to have our stuff taken, we want it paid for. Um, and that resulted in an enshrinement of that idea in the Fifth Amendment. And you notice down here it says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So that was, that was the core concept that uh, you know, they were concerned with. Um, and thus it's embedded directly in our Constitution. And all of the lower governments, starting from the state level, the counties, cities, and so on, all the way down to the tiniest of districts, all inherit this legal right from our Constitution, from the federal government handing it on down, okay? Um, the Supreme Court has affirmed it and indicated that, you know, that uh, in terms of this right, that it, it's, it's the right of the government to seize this property and to a very large extent, leave it up to them to define, is this a public benefit, okay? So that, uh, again, it's very hard to dispute that concept uh, what's interesting though, and a lot of people don't know this part of it, is you notice the last sentence I have there, that um, the local governments for the, a state, county, whatever, can in fact legally assign the right to use eminent domain to non-governmental entities, including even for-profit corporations as well as non-profits. For example, the um, Keystone Pipeline. One of the biggest disputes going on right now about that is that the Keystone folks have been granted the right of eminent domain and they're trying to seize property all across the United States right now to, you know, do for their pipeline. So, you know, there's an, uh, in general, there's a lot of angst out there about the concept of eminent domain. It's like, oh, the government's going to take my property. Um, but the, there are some interesting ramifications to this. First of all, you notice that uh, I point out nor shall private property be taken for public use. You notice it doesn't say real property, it says private property. And the key is that if you go back to the revolutionary times, they were taking everything. But it's been a long time since the government's come into our homes and taken our food from us. You know, they do it indirectly now, but you know, that, uh, they, they at least don't do it directly. And so for the past 200 years, what's happened is the evolution of eminent domain has largely you know, evolved to the point where seizing physical property for putting streets in or a sewage treatment plant or whatever it might be has become the by far dominant use of eminent domain. But inherent at the core of it is the right of the state to seize any kind of property. And if you notice that in Wikipedia, if you go and look at that, they even point out that you know, things like patent rights and contract rights, et cetera, are things that if it's deemed to be in the benefit of the public, they're seizable. Okay, a question for the audience in general. Would there be any benefit to the public to stop foreclosures? <laughs> it's, it's like, duh. <laughs> and in fact, um, I've been working with a, um, uh, a former Attorney General from the state of Ohio on this topic, and he explained to me that there's a, there's a fundamental sort of overarching premise about the raison d'etre to government entities, and that is to be concerned about the general health, safety, and welfare of the public. And if you examine the ramifications of eminent domain, I'm mean, not sorry, eminent domain of, of foreclosures, each and every one of those categories is being decimated. I mean, that, uh, you know, we have increased crime, we've got dropped in property values. You look at the, uh, um, um, the health of like kids that, you know, have, the families have lost their homes, the, uh, the um, uh, yeah, mental disease issues and various other things, you know, have just escalated. We obviously have crimes in a lot of the, the places. So, I mean, it violates all the fundamentals of what a government is supposed to be doing. So the concept of for public benefit, if the, if the idea of stopping foreclosures can uh, produce 
this kind of public benefit, then we have no difficulty in, in the fundamental, this satisfies the purpose of eminent domain. But most of us think, well, how does this help the homeowner? Well, the key is that, let's take a look at the concept of foreclosures. What is a foreclosure to begin with? It's dealing with the idea of a mortgage and a promissory note, which is fundamentally is a contract between fundamentally two parties dealing with property rights, personal property rights. You've got the homeowner on one side and the lending institution on the other. They enter into a bilateral contract that deals with property rights. Does eminent domain have a superior right over property rights? Yes. That's the basic concept again, is that, you know, that uh, when you look at eminent domain as a legal premise, that it trumps or supersedes uh, the idea of any personal property rights. So we can look at the use of eminent domain in two different ways. It could be involved as, as we traditionally see, where it's taking the home from the homeowner we can flip that on its ear and we can say, well, what if the uh, seizing government takes the mortgage and the note from the bank? So if they do that, they then step in the shoes of the bank, say bye-bye bank, and now the county or city or whatever is in a position to basically renegotiate that note with the homeowner and keep them in it. And there's a lot more details to this that that's one of the things that, um, um, well, in fact, let me um, uh, address this idea. This is where I start to explain the idea that, you know, that essentially governments or their proxies could um, use this technique to go in, and especially if there's a pending foreclosure now, that in a pending foreclosure, if it goes through foreclosure, everybody's losing, even the banks. And so um, if uh, we started to apply this concept, and we're just about to try and set up some test cases in Ohio, which is where I'm from, by the way, at this point, I used to be California boy. Um, but um, uh, that what I'm trying to put together there is to take my nonprofit, work with local cities, and say, give us the authority to be able to exercise eminent domain in this very specific way. We'll solve your foreclosure problem for you which means our nonprofit, by the way, that if, if we go to, say, a bank like Citi or Wells or whatever, any of the MERS banks in particular, according to this former attorney general, that um, when they actually go through a foreclosure, they actually are winding up with a less than zero value after the fact. That if the homeowner goes out and so on, that uh, they actually have real costs they start bearing at that point, besides the loss of the whole mortgage, if they don't get a replacement buyer or a new homeowner in there, you know, some renter or whatever, then they're looking at underwater. So he said that in those circumstances, with especially the MERS system bank, uh, mortgages, that we can essentially negotiate a, okay, here's one dollar, you can walk away, you don't have to have any more responsibilities. To them, the value of the home is zero, below zero. But to the homeowner, and to our nonprofit and to the community, there's actual value there that in most cases these property owners uh, could support, maybe say they had a re originally a $100,000 loan, they could afford to pay a $40,000 one. Well, we could renegotiate that for to a $40,000 mortgage now and keep them in the home so you don't have a foreclosure and um, that that's actually rebuilding value in the local community. So there's a lot more details on my website in connection with that um, that I want to direct you to. I have a website where a lot of the information that I've got in various ways, Main Street Matters, MainStreetMatters.us, and in particular in connection with this, that there's a uh, menu item called Resources, and it's got several sub-menu items, and go to the Foreclosure Resources one and look for an article by John Iaquavelli. Um, I did a nationwide um, Occupy conference call where I went in depth into this, how does this um, eminent domain foreclosure issue work? And the details are laid out very well there. Um, so let me, if I may, move on from there. Um, what's the connection to public banking? 
Well, the, uh, the key here is that either a government organization um, or um, a nonprofit organization could use this eminent domain concept, go ahead and uh, stop the foreclosure process, take over the foreclosure, renegotiate it. And by the way, we intend to establish a very humanistic system in this renegotiation. Uh, it may be that they can only afford a fraction of what the house is, is technically worth. Let's say it it's, was a $100,000 mortgage, now we're 60, they can only afford 40. We're in a position to say, okay, we'll give you the 40, and our nonprofit will keep a third of ownership of the, of the home. So we can customize it to each person. We're very unconstrained on that. Now, a nonprofit can do that. The community or the uh, city or whatever could do that, but it's going to be a lot harder for them. That's one of the reasons we're advocating, you know, the nonprofit approach because they have a vested interest. They can be more flexible in, kind of in setting up these kinds of structures. Well, the key is a bank would be better as the vehicle for doing this. I mean, it's a natural. A bank and mortgages, you know, that they would do that. And the key here, though, is, is that banks have the ability to be able to put together financing to get sources of money that, say, a regular nonprofit or the city, you know, would not. So from the standpoint of intersection of these eminent domain, the foreclosure, banking thing, that's a natural combination, even though you know, each of these concepts stand alone. We've obviously been talking all day, um, and we'll talk more about you know, the benefits of public banking without having to deal with the foreclosure concept. But by integrating these two here, we improve on that. And then, of course, the best of all is if we can do this through a public bank concept. Now, I am going to be introducing a um, whole new concept, by the way. So, um, let me start to explain, in connection with banking, that we're actually we're putting together not only this foreclosure system, but we're also simultaneously putting together a hybrid public banking concept as all part of an integrated solution set. And so let me now start to introduce that strategy to you. Key here is, as we've all discussed extensively, and Ellen's written so wonderfully about it and everybody else, that the idea of governments owning a bank is a public bank concept. How many of you are aware that approximately 40% of the banking in Germany right now is public banking? Got <laughs> a few limited hands here. Did you all know that those banks, and there's about 640 of them, they're called the Sparkassen banks, and they are essentially owned by what would be equivalent here in the United States by a local foundation, local community foundation. So 640 community banks, their equivalent to our community banks, are essentially owned by a local nonprofit foundation. So they, they serve the public benefit, all the concepts we've been talking about. And so here we have a model of a non-government owned, some of the earliest banks, as I understand it, did get funding and, and get established by the local government, but then were turned over to this, these private foundations, you know, the community foundation concepts. So instead of just the government, the idea of a nonprofit owning a bank is possible. And in the United States, I'm aware of at least two already. There's one that was established in the state of Virginia that was in fact uh, capitalized by, in part, uh, the biggest capital uh, infusion was from the state. They actually approved a $10, $15 million, something like that, capitalization. Pardon? Somebody have a question? Yeah, this is, this is back, um, I think it's almost a decade now. Um, but yes, yeah, I understand what you mean now. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, but um, it's a CDFI, so, but it's, it's a basically a 501c3 nonprofit organization that owns that. There's another one in California that is actually owned by, they call them a private foundation versus a 501c3 public foundation. And um, a, um, a very progressive, this is very unusual, hedge fund manager in San Francisco uh, has self-funded, you know, that bank there. And they're based in Oakland. And they're very focused on serving the, the, uh, the public within the Oakland area. 
And so we have two examples of the idea of nonprofit owned banks that if you think nonprofit, the assets and resources of nonprofits by uh, IRS requirement and definition are permanently dedicated to the public benefit. If a nonprofit shuts down and if it has any assets left over, it has to give them to another nonprofit. No individual can you know, take those, those assets. So we're fitting the same definition of the government owned, but what you're gonna find is that there are some strengths and weaknesses to each of these models, the public model, I mean the, the government model and the nonprofit model. Um, the key is that there's potentially a third alternative, which is the one that we're starting to go down, is somehow having both of them in a collaborative fashion. Instead of just a government-owned one or just a nonprofit-owned one, we've developed a hybrid strategy for being able to bring them together. And the, uh, the key is, I've really very briefly and tightly summarized the strengths and weaknesses. What you're gonna find is that um, now, in general, with the governments, we all have talked so much about the difficulties we're having trying to get our various governments, whether it's the states or otherwise, to approve these public banks and all the political battles and back and forth that we're going through. So getting that done, getting it accomplished, is certainly a Sisyphusian task, practically. And um, you know, so you know, getting that is probably the single biggest barrier. But uh, the governments have one thing that nonprofits don't. And in the world of the businessman, excuse me, um, that um, uh, the way I would characterize it is they have incredibly strong balance sheets and terrible P&L statements. For those of you without the business backgrounds, a balance sheet basically is your assets and your liabilities. So if you add up all the assets that you've got and add up all the obligations that you've got and you balance them out, which side do you come out on? And because of the pension funds and the rainy day funds and all the other buildings and various other things that they have, most of the governmental entities in this country are actually sitting on very strong balance sheets. So they've got assets which they could deploy in this direction but right now, you know, that they, they are largely limited to investing those in Wall Street. That's about it, okay? But they're literally, collectively across the country, we're talking trillions of dollars in assets in the aggregation of all the, the you know, the governments out there. Um, they just don't know how to get, to get it out there and get it working for them. Nonprofits have the reverse. Those of you who've ever worked with nonprofits, you know, the perennial, God, we need to try and go raise some money for our nonprofit, and it's always such a struggle to go and accrue the resources they need to be able to carry out their goal and objective. But the flip side is, boy, by comparison to the governments in terms of, you know, who's the decision makers and how difficult it is to, you know, go put something together, it's night and day different. That a nonprofit is in many ways much like a, you know, just a for-profit business, the management, the organizers are free to go ahead and put it together without any public consensus one way or the other. Now, we, and the way we're approaching it, we're actually structuring it to have them engaged and involved, but not, not in a management role, but in like advisory type roles and so on, policies, priorities, et cetera. But for the most part, our nonprofit is free to be able to move as quickly as any for-profit business without having to get you know, voter you know, uh, or taxpayer you know, approval on that. So this is the, the diagram that kind of summarizes the structure that we have come up with. Let me, if I may, divert for just a second. I know you all have been looking into banking a lot, but I don't know if you've gotten your arms around one of the key fundamental differences out there that, that has a significant impact on uh, what a bank can do, and it has to do with whether or not the owners own the bank directly. Like if you set up a local community bank um, and you then go and raise capital from the community and the shareholders buy directly into the bank, then that's a standalone bank, and that's how many community banks have gotten established and go, by the way, how are we doing? Okay, thanks. 
I'm trying to watch the time again to leave time for Q&A. Um, but uh, let's say that you wanted to now have two banks. Well, can you start to see the complexity that comes in? Is that now you, you've got individual equity that you're now doing into two banks. When, what happens when you get to three? Or you, know, you want to have multiple branches and you go to various other places. Long story short, there's a concept called a bank holding company. That typically, when you get beyond the point of a single com uh, bank, then um, you start getting into this, well, instead of having a standalone entity and the owners own the bank directly, you create a overarching, like parent company, you've heard that term before, so you have a parent company that owns one or more banks, but it turns out that if you set up a bank holding company, that there are rules and regulations about having a bank holding company that allows it to also do other things that banks can't do. For example, you notice down here, we point out other financial institutions. You could set up a mortgage company, you could set up an insurance company, an investment banking firm, there's all kinds of different things. And this, by the way, is what the Wall Street banks are structured as, okay? And uh, to give you a sense that there's like, two different worlds here, if you're dealing with strictly just the, the one world of a single standalone bank, then you either have a state or the feds as your overarching regulator, plus the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, as the two friends in the regulators that you've got to deal with. If you set up a bank holding company, then the bank holding company comes under a, another special category where the Fed is the regulator of the bank holding companies. So now you get three regulators you're having to deal with. But again, you have greater flexibility. Well, well, without trying to drill into the details of this, we've designed a way, working with a bank holding company concept, for us to be able to establish one or more banks, and by the way, for those of you who've ever looked more closely into the concept of um, setting up a bank, every advisor I've dealt with in the country has always said to me, the fastest way to have a bank is to buy one. Don't try and go through the process of setting one up from scratch, which is what every one of our governments is having to do under the current you know, contemplated models. And folks, we've got huge problems out there that we need to start addressing as fast as possible. And to put this in perspective, your typical cycle time from the time you decide we want to set up a bank to having it open is typically one to two years, okay? We can't wait, we've got to get going. Which is why if you buy a bank, you can cut that time frame down to a few months. There's approvals you've got to get, but it's a lot faster to do that, plus you're up and running. So we've got one that we're looking at right now that we're looking at acquiring, bringing in, and putting it into a particular structure that would allow us to then go to primarily the governments, but you know certain kinds of nonprofits, foundations and church groups and others who have investment funds are candidates as well. But if you notice on the top there, see the, uh, the item up here we say passive investors? The way we've structured this is essentially the nonprofits, my nonprofit, plus we're dealing right now with the German Sparkazen folks who are helping us to figure out who's the right partner from Germany to work to put this first model together to be our co-managing partner on this thing, so they bring obviously all their expertise to the table. Uh, we bring uh, the local knowledge and the entrepreneurism and so on and so forth to the table. And we will be the active managers. That's what this particular level is here. So we set up the bank, we, we uh, or at least the banking organization, you know, put the deal together to be able to acquire a bank, put all the details in place so that we then can turn around and go to the cities, the counties, even states, and say, what we're, uh, we've structured this in a way where with each one of them, we can offer them a custom investment arrangement. That, uh, let's say I'm in the city of Youngstown. Go to the city of Youngstown and say, okay, you know, yeah, you'd like the idea, the benefit of having a public bank, but instead of you having to set it up and run it, which is an active investment role, uh, why not step in, in right in sync with what you're already doing? You've got 
a treasurer who's responsible for investing you know, tens of millions of dollars right now on Wall Street, you figure out how much of that you want to put into a bank. We create a special account for you. You determine how much you want to also deposit in there and we'll provide you with a virtual branch concept. So we'll take those resources and through accounting, say, okay, you tell us what you want them to be directed to priorities and policy wise in Youngstown. You wanna support green projects, you wanna support your local community banks and small business, you tell us. So each one of the investors, we can customize the arrangement with them and it's really consistent with the way government accounting works anyway, which is all kinds of separate little buckets. That's the way that governments you know, do their accounting as contrast profits and nonprofits who put everything in one bucket. Governments isolate things into small buckets, individual buckets. So this is very consistent with what they already do already. So we'll find, we'll, we'll take your stuff, we'll put it into a separate dedicated bucket and use it the way that you define. So you're in essence running a bank you know, and Burger King, have it your way. Now, again, this document, we've got a detailed analysis document that drills into all the rationale behind this, why we structured each of the pieces this way, how the governments and the nonprofits we essentially would cooperate and coordinate, who does what, et cetera. Um, all of that is detailed in this particular document here, which again, you go back to my, uh, the resources tab, look for the public banking resources and then look for the article in that that's called Banking and Credit in America. I'm going to uh, stop there again to open it up for Q&A. Thank you very much. Michael, and um, we've got time for some questions here. So here you go. Can you just clarify something for me? What do you mean when you say a, um, a public nonprofit? A say again. You were saying the difference, something between the difference between a public nonprofit and a private non. A five hundred one c three is a private nonprofit entity. I'm a little confused. Could you and also? I would apologize. You explain, would you explain more the passive and the passive partners? I'm not sure what that is. Are those investors or what is that? Okay. Yeah. Two different issues there, if I heard you correctly, and I apologize if I didn't, uh, please um, respond back again. Um, I very possibly misused the term public or private uh, when I was talking about the nonprofits. Nonprofits, uh, in many ways, are like private or you know, for-profit businesses. The key distinction is nobody owns them. That a nonprofit, by definition, is owned in trust for the public. It's managed by some people who, like a trustee in a trust, they're responsible for many resources, but they don't have any ownership. So any employee has no ownership in it, et cetera. Um, your second point was on what? The, the question of passive partners. Oh, passive, okay. In the investor world, um, there is, are fundamentally two categories, um, and in fact, they, they, these definitions are extremely important. They carry uh, major legal consequences to them. Um, the, um, uh, this active and passive investor concept, um, the closest example I could give that you know, for many of you that you'd be familiar with is a, the concept of a, of a limited partnership, as they call it. A limited partnership is minimum two parties, one party that's called the general partner and the other is a limited partner. The general partner is the one that's responsible for running the organization and they also bear all the risks and liabilities that go along with that management role. A limited partner or a passive investor is only um, uh, at risk to the extent of their investment. So there's that major legal consequence uh, here. So when we go back to uh, the, this model here, when we look at the counties, the cities, and other governmental entities, as well as nonprofit foundations, we're basically offering to them to be passive investors, which is what today is what they do. You know, that if they've got a pension fund, you've got a treasurer, they basically go place those monies with some financial manager 
and they have no role whatsoever in the say of how those funds are used. That's a pure passive investment type role. So we're offering them a passive investment role with the exception we're saying, but you tell us the policy. What do you want us to apply these to? We'll make the lending decisions and so on and so forth, so we'll make sure that they're handled and managed properly. But you get to have a say of where you want those funds to go in general and what you want them to apply to. Did that answer your question, ma'am? Yes, thank you. Okay. By the way, Ellen had a question too, so if somebody could get her a microphone. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. My name is Mark Cassell. I teach at Kent State uh, University, also in Ohio. Um, I had a couple of thought questions. One, in your first part of your presentation on, on foreclosures, um, I wondered wh whether you had taken a look at the Homeowner Loan Corporation as a model. It struck me that the eminent domain approach that you took, or that you're suggesting, is that the state entity that, uh, that Ohio set up? No. The, the Homeowner Loan Corporation was created in the 1930s, and it was essentially a, um, a corporation that um, took over uh, mortgages from financial institutions um, and re essentially reworked them. Um, and, uh, and it also uh, was it, uh, also serviced the loans as well. Okay. And um, the reason that that's a model so essentially, the situation was similar to the current situation where many homeowners were underwater. And um, the banks voluntarily um, essentially sold those loans at a, much, at a discounted rate. Right. But still, there was enough equity left in the home to give the homeowner a reason to stay. Yep. Um, and the, got, the federal government uh, kept that loan until it was, uh, until it was paid off. And the, and, the, and the Homeowner Loan Corporation actually made a, made a profit and, and shut its doors after it was done. Um, so I was going to ask you, is it still in existence? Because I plead ignorance on it and I, I have never heard of it. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, it's actually, it's also interesting in that sense because many people sort of assume that the, a government agency goes on forever and the Homeowner Loan Corporation, corporation is actually an example right. of an agency that shuttered, earned a profit. What, however, the Homeowner Loan Corporation, and this is why I would recommend taking a look at it, yeah. w what you're suggesting in terms of your foreclosures, what the homeowner loan corporation recognized was it required a lot of work to work with homeowners. Yes. Um, in other words, it was an agency that was heavily involved in people's lives. Yes. Um, I don't see that in what you're suggesting. I, I didn't drill into that, and, but uh, that's one of the reasons that we're, we're saying that we think this is better managed and handled by nonprofit organizations versus the um, cities or counties or whatever who are really not equipped to deal with the homeowners at that level. That's part of our strategy that, that we're looking at a much more extensive interface requirement uh, with the homeowners, wherein we think we can do that with a lot of nonprofits that are already trying to work with that community now. This gives them an additional tool. So they're, you know, right now, they're very limited in what they can do. This, you know, uh, they could actually, if they learn this, that nonprofit could then go to the local cities and they could start doing what we're, we'll teach them to do. So we're looking at a highly dispersed network like Gar was talking about earlier that, um, you know, doing things at more the grassroots level instead of necessarily trying to concentrate it. So we're trying to develop the model and replicate it out there. Uh, Tim Howell from Boston. Thank you for a talk that really has opened my eyes to how creative you can be in financing. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you for a talk that has uh, opened my eyes a bit to how creative financing can actually be, uh, working the way you are. But uh, I just have two questions, clarification questions I'd appreciate answers to. One is, uh, the bank holding company would also be a nonprofit. And the second question is, how does a uh, bank owned by a nonprofit differ from a, uh, uh, a credit union today? And a good interesting point there, um, and that the key is the bank holding company and even the banks would be for-profit entities. N nonprofits can own for-profit businesses. Think Goodwill, okay? Um, you know, so uh, the key is, what's the reason that the nonprofit was set up? The IRS will look at that and say, if you were set up like this, if we were there to try and rescue homeowners and we're creating an organization and we're building this business around that service objective, then they would call this a related business concept and 
uh, the income that would come from that would go to the nonprofit tax-free. Okay, if you know uh, we're a, a a church and we really weren't in that business, but we started a bank. Um, we could be crossing over a line into what the inverse of that is called unrelated business income, and then that could become taxable to the nonprofit, just as though it were any person that's getting income and having tax on it. Okay, so the, the what is owned can be for-profit entity. In fact, it has to be in order for us to bring in the government entities and the nonprofit entities as co-owners. You have to use an ownership structure, which is a for-profit entity, to do that. But the owners themselves can be nonprofit, government, nonprofits, etc. Okay? Hi there. Hi. Uh, Carla Rautenberg, Cleveland, Ohio. Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. Um, so I have one comment and two quick questions. This does sound to me kind of like the creative finance that we have all come to know and love. Um, but my questions are, who is the former Ohio Attorney General? And the second question is uh, about where is the accountability in this model? Okay. What happens who is accountable when things go wrong in this model? Um, your first question, it's Mark Dan. Is the, the gentleman is the former attorney general. Um, and in terms of accountability, it's the same kind of accountability really that, you know, well, you got two parties here, but with, since this structure has the active management by the nonprofits, then it's the same kind of accountability that any nonprofit has out there. And yeah, which essentially, it, it, well that, that gets down to how do you structure it? Who's the board? Who's the advisory board, et cetera? That's, that's a pro and that's a con. The, the fact that it, it doesn't have the requirement for a lot of input like governmental entities is what allows it to be able to move in the time frame that we need. And that's why we're bringing in, for example, these very professional bankers to help us to be able to structure this in a very grounded, practical business way by a group who is public bankers. You know, there's very few public bankers in this country. We have one of the former uh, senior uh, VPs from B&D here today but there are very few in this country, whereas there's a huge group of them in Germany. And so that's why we're tapping into that group you know, to bring in that expertise to provide this. But it's, it's ultimately going to be up to the managers and organizers of this in terms of how they structure it in terms of accountability. And it gets down to you know, motive and so on. Why are we in it? I'm doing it because of the public service concept. And, uh, and I'm going to structure it where we're going to have a lot of input, like each one of the different investors, creating an opportunity for them to define how they want their funds to be used. Nobody gives them that kind of opportunity today. <coughs> and, you know, it would be very hard for governments to do that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, quick question, and I apologize if you uh, said this already. Uh, Glenda Humiston from California. Um, we just recently enacted into law the benefit Corporation. Yep. I'm wondering if you've looked at the, how that might work for this model you're discussing. I'm, I've met with the organizers of that. I know it well. And um, it, apples and oranges. Uh, it it could have a place here, but it, it's not needed. The very essence of it is a, a benefit corporation. So. Yes, sir. Paris on Lockett, Washington, D.C. Quick statement and question. Um, I was interested in your comment about the Landesbank in Germany. Are there any... By the way, it's Sparkhausen, not Landesbank, which is a different group. Okay. Uh, are there any restrictions as far as uh, in your uh, diagram or your, your suggestion of the holding company as far as foreign entities or foreign countries that can participate? So, you, if I may, are you saying that uh, if we were to replicate this in some other country, would we 
have to structure it differently? Is that what your question if was? You if you design it to operate here in the United States, are there any limitations that the United States government puts on you as far as foreign entities that can participate or foreign countries that you can accept money from? Um, I'm not sure I fully, you know, I'm hearing the, the question, so let me respond to what I think I hear. Part of the reason I've designed it the way I have is to minimize these kinds of potential interferences the way I would view it down to the point where within this structure we have no more oversight uh, requirement than any for-profit bank would experience with the regulators and because we've got regular for-profit entities in there and uh, properly applying what nonprofits are allowed to do and what the government's allowed to do, there's very little in the way of additional, uh, if any, um, uh, oversight, possibly interference, et cetera, that is present in, under this structure. I mean, it'd be like if I want to go set up a, a bank of my own, a for-profit bank, it's very close to that kind of you know, freedom with exception to the regulators. See, your nonprofits, they have rules they have to follow primarily with IRS to you know, abide by the, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do in order to fulfill their exempt purpose, as they call it. And this thing would be designed that its exempt purpose is to provide this kind of benefit and service. So it would be consistent with what it tells the IRS, here's what I'm going to do. And if, as long as it does that, then IRS just fill in the tax forms. Okay? The, the, actually, though, the one place where there is, and that's a good point that I, now you've said this, and, I, and we need to wrap. Um, the government, what they're allowed to invest in passively is not a universal across the country. So this is typically not a federal government question, but a state law question. So the folks in Ohio, the state itself, the counties, the cities, what you'll typically find is there are different regulatory levels for each of those. For example, this uh, um, former AG, the Attorney General I was talking about, advised me, said, Michael, actually the cities have more flexibility than the counties do based on the normal regulations in the state of Ohio. So we should look at trying to work with the cities first over the counties. So, you know, and that varies state by state. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.